said, our annual congregational meeting is this Wednesday evening at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. So um, if you can, uh, come by and see what's been happening over the past year and maybe what is in store for this next year as well. The other thing is, um, take time to stop at Connection Central to sign up for our Valentine's dinner if you haven't done that yet. Um, we'd love to have it as many as possible. Again, that is for couples, but it's also for singles. It's Valentine's, but uh, we just like the opportunity to get together. We're going to have great fellowship. Uh, we have a catered meal. You're going to have live music, um, all for a $15 ticket. So, guys, you can't take those ladies out for less than that, I know. So, um, stop by and sign up for that at Connection Central. If you want to stand, we'll pray and ask our worship team to come up and uh, get us rolling in worship this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, good morning. Thank you for another morning. Thank you for another opportunity uh, to gather together and worship you, Lord. Uh, we just uh, appreciate so much uh, the opportunity to come together as your body, as your church, and sing praises to you and hear your word. And so, Father, as um, we look forward to doing that, again, may the words and the thoughts and everything about us just be focused on you and that they bring you a blessing this morning, and they're worthy in your sight. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a good God, don't we? Amen. We have a lot to be thankful for. Let's spend this time worshiping our great God and all the good things that he has blessed us with. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. That never runs dry Drink of the water Come and thirst no more Oh, come all you sinners Come find his mercy Come to the table he will satisfy Taste of his goodness Find what you're looking for
Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. And the joy we 
This morning, I want to share some thoughts that I found by a minister named Dustin Crow. The title of this is Focusing on God's Grace Rather Than Our Guilt. This morning, I want to remind us Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper so that we might feed on and be refreshed by Him. Too often, we view the Lord's Supper as something that is overly self reflected and guilt driven. A lot of times we think this time is primarily about what I need to do to fix things. What I need to do to remember and confess every sin that I've committed this past week. I need to feel guilty for how I fall, how short I fall. Many times we make the Lord's Supper about us and our sin instead of Jesus and His grace. But for most of us following Christ this morning... The reality is that we come here on Sunday probably aware of how sinful and undeserving we are. We bring our burdens and pains in here, and we need God to refresh us with His grace. We bring our doubts and fears into this room because we need God to grant us assurance. We come aware of our sins and how messed up we are, and so we need the gospel of free grace applied to our hearts. And that is exactly why God gave us the Lord's Supper. This isn't what we do once we've gotten things right on our end. We do it believing that God makes us right through the body and blood of Jesus. Yes, this is a time to confess your sins. But instead of trying to clean yourself up or staying in a place of guilt there in your seats, come to Jesus in the Lord's Supper as an act of faith where you say, He is the answer, and He alone is what I need. The Lord's Supper is not about our worthiness and our fitness, but it is about the worthiness of Jesus and how He, in amazing grace, makes us fit to sit at God's table. As you eat and drink this morning, do so with an awareness that Jesus is still today, in this moment, a sufficient Savior for all our sins. And He offers to us grace to help in any situation we're up against. As we take these physical objects of bread and juice, may God give us a powerful taste of the forgiveness and fullness of Jesus for us. The Lord's Supper is an invitation not for those who've got things under control or who are good people. It's the invitation for sinful and weak Christians in need of God's and Christ's grace. Jesus invites us to come to him in the Lord's Supper. 
All who are thirsty, he says, come. All who are weak and wounded, come. All who are aware of their sin and the need of grace, come. This morning, I want to challenge you to do something. I know many times we open up our packages, pop the piece of bread in our mouth, drink the cup of juice. This morning, as you take that piece of bread, crush it in your mouth. Think about the nails that were driven into the hands and feet of Jesus as his body was broken. As you drink that juice, savor it. Hold it in your mouth for a little bit. Remember that it represents the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the invitation that you give to us as believers in Christ to come to the table. We come with our sins. We come in need of your grace. We confess that we have failed you every day. And we come this morning because you're here and you want to meet with us. You want to shower us with your love. You want to forgive us of our sins. You want to remind us that the sacrifice of your son paid the full atonement for all of our sins. So we come this morning to meet with you and to ask you to reassure us, to forgive us, to cleanse us once again. We know that that is possible through the blood of your son. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Oh, 
How I love Jesus Because He first loved me Sing it one more time. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Amen. This time the children are dismissed for Children's Church. And while they're leaving, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Chapter 8 will be verses 35 through 39 uh, today, Romans 8, 35 through 39. I heard about a, a, a lady who went with her friend to the police station to report that her husband was, was missing. And the policeman asked the lady for a description, and she said, well, he's 6'2", he has deep blue eyes, he has dark wavy hair, an athletic build, well-groomed, sharply dressed, weighs about 185 pounds, he's soft-spoken, well-mannered, and treats our kids so well, just absolutely loves the children. The friend spoke up and said, but your husband is fat, 5'3", rude, smokes cigars, he's bald, he's got a big mouth, he never bathes, he's dressed as sloppy, his teeth are rotten, and he treats your kids like garbage. And the wife replied by saying, yeah, but who wants that one back? Uh, that's not exactly unfailing love, is it? Um, Unfailing love is Paul this morning. Paul walks in with a big Purdue coat on and a Purdue mug and drinking coffee from his Purdue mug. And uh, that's unfailing love right there uh, to bring that into a house of God. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, in, in all seriousness, probably in a couple of weeks, there, there's a good chance we won't have church on Sunday because Purdue and IU will play again at Mackey. And so anyway, Romans 8, 35 through 39. Uh, here's what the Bible tells us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For centuries, uh, people have been looking for love. And if I can borrow a line from Urban Cowboy and the old country, Johnny Lee. Did, remember that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? That's kind of where I think we see our society today. We're seeing people looking for acceptance or looking for love in a lot of places that they really have no business going. How else can we explain the record-setting number of divorces, the increase in pornography, a society that is replacing the traditional definition of marriage with alternative lifestyles. Where can we go to find lasting love? Where can we find a love that truly works in a world determined to uh, redefine the word itself? I think what we try to do sometimes is we try to go to society and see what society is saying, but we know that society doesn't really know. They don't have a clue. So we can't go there. We can't go to religion because religion misinterprets love because they're all about rules and regulation. We can't go to Hollywood because they've misrepresented it down through the years. You can't go to authors and playwrights because they have as much trouble defining it as anyone else. So where do we go? Well, obviously, as a preacher, you would expect me to say, let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible has to say about love. Maybe it's time to go back to the one who the Bible says is love, the one who created love, the one who uh, does everything because 
of love. Let's go there and, and see what God has to say about the meaning of uh, of love, because I believe that God deeply, he, he longs for everyone to experience the fullness of, of the love that he created, the love that he is. And, and if we want real love, if we want ideal love, if we want perfect love, it's only found in God's love for us. Therefore, he lures us away from all of that stuff that Satan tries to trap us in. All of these things that the world calls love, God is calling us out from those things. All of those things that are competing for our affection, God says, no, here's what true love is. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 31, 3, long ago, the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. Love, I have drawn you unto myself. And so when it comes to this topic of love, what we can say is this probably, love is life's driving priority. In fact, we talked about it last week that, that without love, we're absolutely nothing. That's what the Bible says. We can't accomplish anything that's worth anything at all without love. With, if we don't have love in our lives, we're, we're zero, Right? And this is because every minute of every day since we heard and since we met God, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you're in this relationship, you should know and understand that his love is pursuing us. He is pursuing a relationship with us. He wants more than anything to have an intimate relationship with us. I think this is part of the problem that we see in a lot of our churches. We have people who make decisions to accept Jesus but not follow him. We have people who say, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but then they don't really want to dive into that relationship that helps you become a better person the whole time that you're, you're getting there and helps you to love God more and helps you to love mankind even more, right? And so there's nothing that we can do, no place that we can go where God's love is not pursuing us and God's love is uh, wanting to meet us wherever we might find ourselves. God's love knows no bounds. No matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter how we may feel, whether we feel good or whether we feel bad, God is there. We can't get away from God's love. We cannot chase it away. No matter how hard we try, God's love is unconditional for us. And this is at the heart of the matter when King David wrote this, you go before me and follow me, you place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. How can God love us that much? Raise your hand if you're parents. Do you love your children in this way? Most days. Yeah, you know, Rod's going, "Eh, maybe. Yeah, we do. We love our children that way. And yet, for some reason, even though we know that we love our children unconditionally, and no matter what they're doing, even though they may irritate us at times, we love them in such a manner that it doesn't matter what they do wrong, we're never going to stop loving them. That doesn't mean we like what they're doing. That doesn't mean we approve of everything that we're doing. And so we know that as parents, but for some reason, we have a hard time putting that on God and saying, God could love us. In that way. I believe God is saying to us that while he cares about what we do, he deeply hurts when we sin. Again, let's put this back on us as parents. Does it bother you when you see your children going the wrong way? Absolutely it does. But you never stop loving them. And he demonstrates for us just how far he will go to pursue us with this kind of love. Again, doesn't mean he approves of what we're doing. But he never stops loving us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Even when we were his enemy, even when we were living apart from him, when we were separated from God, God chose to send his son to die for us. And so God loves us through the highest of highs. He loves us through the lowest of lows and nothing There is absolutely nothing that can separate us from this. The Apostle Paul said this. We read this a moment ago. Verses 38 and 39. I am convinced. Right? Paul has seen it with his own eyes. He knows where he has been. 
He knows where he's at. He knows where some of his friends have been and where they're at. And he's saying this, after seeing all of this going on and seeing the Holy Spirit work in his life and other people's life, he says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we feel like we've blown it, has anybody ever been there? You ever just feel like you've blown it? Have you ever been in a place where you feel like, I don't even know if God likes me right now? Even when we feel that way, right? And, this, and, and if God in no possible way could love us, He still does. He still loves us. And he is pursuing that relationship with us. And so as we continue discussing this idea of unfailing love in our lives, let's consider the following. God's love is incredible. Can I get an amen to that? His love is absolutely incredible. The apostle John writes of God's incredible love for us when he calls those who believe in his son Jesus his children. That's what God calls it. We're his kids. I like the way Max Lucado said it. He goes, if, if, if God had a refrigerator in, in heaven, your, your picture would be on it. That's how much he loves you. You are his child. Basically, it is through our belief in Jesus Christ that God adopts us into his family. Look at what John says in 1 John 3, 1. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But what does it mean when John says, see how much our Father loves us? Well, Kenneth West puts it this way in his word study. He says that it's a love that is out of this world. And in other words, he's saying the love of God is otherworldly. It's a love like nobody else can emulate down here. It's a love that we can't even understand. It's otherworldly. There's nothing in this world that can ever compare to the love of God. It's so incredible. And as we looked at earlier, that while we were yet sinners and God's enemies, the Lord in his wonderful and in his incredible love sent his son Jesus to die for us. And thus, through the forgiveness of our sins, through Jesus, we can now be adopted into his family, as Mike was talking about earlier. Such love is beyond our comprehension. I mean, who does that, right? Who would do that for anyone? The answer is obviously God. Again, I go back to what John said, and, and this time it is found in his, his gospel. And, and, the, and the really cool thing about this, the really wonderful thing about this, about this incredible love, is we are beneficiaries, we are heirs of God through belief in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Here's what it says in John 1, 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so his wonderful, his marvelous love, his incredible love has brought us into his family. We are family members with Jesus. And we're now called his sons and daughters. Guys, I'd let that sink in for just a moment. Right? That we are family members of God's, and that's how incredible his love is for us. And it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that God would do that. We, we sung about it a, a little bit ago. Mike mentioned it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God proved his love for us when he sent Jesus to die for us so that we can be made right with him. It's unbelievable. As parents, a lot of you have had children who have gone into the military, right? And, and that's, an, that's an incredible thing as well, right? You send them off to, to fight for God and country, and, and you know that there's the possibility that they may die in service. But would we do the same that is, give up our sons and daughters to help save a traitor? Would we give up our sons and daughters to save a murderer? An abuser? 
The answer is no. None of us would do that, right? There's no way we're going to trade our child for someone who is so vile. But not so with God. God gave His Son for the worst of the worst. His enemies. He gave His Son to die for the ungodly, for the wicked, for the depraved, those who expressly hate Him, those who would curse Him to His face. God gave His one and only Son to die for those kind of people, us. Because, I mean, honestly... We're not a whole lot better. While we may have some things in our life we won't get arrested for, we got a lot of things in our lives that just aren't all that pretty. This was the whole point of what Paul was talking about in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Can you imagine the emotional toll that that took on God? When when God is in heaven and and he's saying, I'm going to send my son now, and take on human form so he can be mistreated and eventually murdered by the very ones that he was sent to save. Can you imagine the hurt and the pain that God felt through all of that? Watching his son being unmercifully beaten and nailed to a cross. Well, he did that for us. Can you imagine how God felt for the first time since the beginning of time that he was separated from his son? That's the price that God paid. That's the price that Jesus paid. That's the price that each of them were willing to go so that you and I could be in a relationship with him. And that's why his love is incredible. And that's why it's unbelievable. But let me tell you something as well. It's also a little bit frightening, isn't it? When you stop and think about it, it's a little bit frightening just how much God loves us. During the Welsh revival in the early 1900s, a Welshman was praying in English, but he was thinking in the native tongue when he began to quote Psalm 130, verse 4, which says, but you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. He was having trouble translating that, putting that into the right words, and he stumbled trying to find trying to find out just what to say. Eventually, he brought forth this translation. He said, there is forgiveness with thee enough to frighten us. What a revelation, right? That God's loving kindness toward us that forgives our sins is so great that it's frightening. God's loving kindness is so great and so wonderful is the forgiveness of his sins for us That it fills us with a love that is truly frightening. And the idea behind this is this. We are not necessarily frightened by God or frightened of God, but that it's a love toward us that is so great. And this is what the translation literally says, is that it literally takes our breath away. Have you ever been so frightened by something that it just just scares you? I remember probably the scaredest I ever was in my life, and I told you this story before, I think, but Stacy and I were dating at the time, and we were watching a movie that probably shouldn't have been watched in the first place. Anybody remember Chucky and Child's Play and, and all that? And, and so the movie didn't really scare me all that much, but while I was watching the movie with Stacy, her brother sneaks out of the house, goes and gets in my 1978 Pinto, and ties a doll from the rearview mirror of the car. And so when I come out and get in the car and I sit in the car, there's a doll hanging from the mirror. And I'm like, <gasps> I mean, it literally took my breath away. And I just about took her brother's breath away after that because I was not very happy. I was frightened. But the kind of love that God has for us is not that scary, frightening, but it's just so immense and so great that it takes our breath away. Normally, when we contemplate our sin, there is the natural response of of becoming frightened of God's punishment. And that's not an unhealthy fear at all, to be frightened of God's punishment. I think that's a very, very healthy thing. I think that helps to keep us in line. But in speaking to the church at Philippi, the Apostle Paul says this, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So Paul is saying that's healthy to do that. 
But this isn't what the psalmist is trying to convey. Listen to how he puts it. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. It's time for us to stop being afraid of punishment because we are resting in the love of God. And if we are in Christ Jesus, there's not going to be punishment for our sins because he's already paid the price. Now, that doesn't give us the right to go out and do whatever we want to do. But we need to understand just how great his love is and what it's done for us. And when we realize God's love for us, that is giving his son to take our place, dying the death that we deserve on the cross. I mean, it's kind of frightening because we are accountable to him now. And we need to raise our love quotient. We need to raise our love for God to a whole new level when we really stop and contemplate what God has done for us through Jesus. And so we truly serve a loving, awesome God. And, and I think, you know, here we're coming up on Valentine's Day, and this is, God, this is God's Valentine to us. And our Valentine back to him would be to accept that love and rest in his promises. Because God's love is limitless. That's the fourth thing. If you're taking notes, it has no limits. It has no boundaries. We'll never be able to get away from it. We'll never be able to go beyond it. And it, I mean... It, it's, and, and it's not like this creepy stalker kind of thing because, you know, here, I'm, I'm, as I'm thinking this, it's like, you know, that sounds a little bit oppressive, doesn't it? The guy, that's not what we're talking about. It, 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 it's a love that is always there. But as, as I used to hear a, a preacher say when I was growing up all the time, God is a gentleman, right? He's never going to force anything on you, but he's always there, always ready to do the right thing, and it's limitless. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, says about it, right? Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is His love for us. God's love is greater than anything we'll ever know in this lifetime. And it'll accomplish more in us than we would ever dare to ask hope. It's limitless. No matter what situation we may face, He's there for us. He's never going to stop loving us. That was a hard lesson for me to learn because when I was younger, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I did a lot of stupid stuff. I know. I know that's a, a shock for a lot of you. The Bible says, May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. And so here's the deal. God doesn't parcel out his love to us. His love is boundless. And it endlessly flows to us. Literally, God's love floods our hearts. God's limitless, loving touch gives us all the encouragement and all the hope that we're ever going to need. And his love will never fail and it never gives up because it's given through his grace. Not on anything that we can do. That's the thing. I think sometimes we don't really genuinely believe that God loves us that much because we haven't done enough good things to cause him to want to love us. We don't have to. He loves us for who we are. He doesn't want us to stay where we're at, but he loves us for who we are. God is immeasurably generous. and He gives us this love abundantly. He gives it to us without measure. And the fifth thing is it's uncommon. The Apostle Paul declares that the depth of God's unbelievable love is this agape love that we've talked about down through the years that we're all probably pretty familiar with, this unconditional love. Romans 5, 6, and 7, when we were utterly helpless. Have you ever felt utterly helpless? Paul was feeling this way when he wrote this. 
He's saying all of us probably have been there. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But Jesus died for us sinners, us messed up people. Maybe we can think about this kind of love for those kind of people who, who go the extra mile for people maybe they haven't even met yet. I think of like I think of um, I think of military personnel. I think of first responders who are willing to rush into a building that's on fire maybe, and um, they don't know if they're going to live or die, and they're rushing into a building trying to save people that they've never even met or people that come upon a wreck, and they're willing to get into a vehicle that they don't know if it's going to explode or not and try to help get a person out to save their lives. When I think of those kinds of people, it kind of portrays to me the love of God because that's what he has done for us. A bunch of people, and he knew us, but we didn't love him. With Jesus, he went beyond. Not only did he die for those who had their act together, he died for all of us who hated him, who were ungodly. You know, it's an incredible thought to think that the very person who was running a spear into his side, Jesus was dying for. The very person that was killing him, he was doing it for them. And he died for those that are without strength, those who are unlovely and unlovable, the cast-offs of society, the untouchables, those who are destitute, those who in society are without value. He died for all of us. This uncommon love. And it's available. It's, a, it's available to everyone and to anyone. And it defies logic, but it doesn't defy reason. Does that make sense? It defies logic, but it doesn't defy reason. First, it's because God's love for us is a part of his very nature. That is, God is love. Second, God loves us because he made us. And while we still sin, and we've destroyed some of, I guess, uh, ourselves uh, because of our sin, and Satan just keeps chipping away at us and keeps chipping away at our mind and and, and our peace because of our our sin. God made us, and we are of unique value to him. Has anybody ever made something like maybe in shop class at school uh, that you're just really, really proud of, but really when you look at it, it wasn't really all that good, right? And you're like, but but I made that. That's awesome. I mean, I remember one year... Uh, when we were growing up, I was just a little guy. We were in vacation Bible school, and my brother Jeff, during vacation Bible school, it was arts and crafts time, and, and we were making these little clay, uh, whatever we wanted to make. We could make like a flower pot or whatever. And so my brother Jeff, it was nearing Father's Day, and so my brother Jeff wanted to make something for my dad for Father's Day in vacation Bible school at church. And so he makes an ashtray. For my dad. Well, dad did smoke. He smoked for about 40 years. And, and Jeff made this, this ashtray uh, in Bible school. And uh, he loved it. He was really proud of it. And dad loved it uh, because Jeff made it for him. Now, everybody else in the church was looking at that and going, what's going on in the Bridgewater house that, that we ought to know about? But um, it was something that Jeff and dad loved. Mom didn't love it all that much. But uh, It was just one of these unique things that the two of them shared because Jeff made it for dad, all right? Well, God made us. And even though we are far from perfect, he's incredibly proud of us. And he loves us so much and we are of so much value because he sees us not necessarily for what we are, are, but he sees us for what we can be. I mean, he sees us for what we are and who we are, that we're his children, and he's always going to love us. But he, as I said, he doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us to grow to be something greater than we could ever become on our own. 
He wants to see us become something uh, that is of great value in his kingdom. He loves us because he knows that, that uh, you know, maybe someday we'll get our act together. And it totally breaks his heart when he sees something, someone that he's made turn their back on him. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15, it says, Yet the Lord chose your ancestors as the objects of his love, and he chose you, their descendants, above all other nations, as is evident today. And the word there in the Hebrew is literally fastened. God fastened his love upon them. When you fasten something, it holds together. It, it never, never separates, right? God fastened his love to you. And I don't know if you've ever accepted that love or not, right? I don't know. But I hope if you're here today and you've never received that love, that, that you would be willing to consider a relationship with him today. I, I would hope and pray that, that maybe you today would understand just what God has done for you, his incredible, unbelievable, frightening, limitless, uncommon love, his Valentine card to the human race. You would accept that and enter into that relationship with him if you've not done that. If you have already done that, but you've kind of just, I don't know, drifted, and not really held up your end of the, the bargain. Would you consider maybe remembering your first love today? One day Charles Spurgeon was walking through the English countryside with a friend. And as they strolled along the evangelist noticed a barn. And there was a weather vane on top of the barn. And at the top of the weather vane these words were uh, attached to it. It said God is love. And Spurgeon remarked to his companion that he thought it was a rather inappropriate place for such a message. Weather veins are changeable, Spurgeon said, and God's love is not changeable. And his companion said, I don't agree with you, Charles. You misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth. Regardless of whatever way the wind blows, God is love. And his love is available for you today. I'm going to ask our worship team to come, and if you're here today and you've never entered into that relationship with him, we teach here that, that you confess Christ uh, as the son of the living God, and whatever sin is in your life, you repent of that sin, and if you've not been baptized into him, the Bible teaches that you need to be baptized for the washing away of your sins, and maybe that's a decision you want to make today, to enter into this relationship for the first time with Christ. If so, we invite you to come. Maybe you're here and you feel like you've blown it. And you feel like God just doesn't love you anymore. That couldn't be farther from the truth. He loves you today just as much as he ever has. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and Maybe you just need prayer today. Would you can join us on these front seats. We'll, we'll kneel beside you and pray with you if you have a need today that you need prayed for. Or maybe, again, it's a first-time decision. Maybe you're watching online and you want to reach out to us through our church connection number. Uh, we invite you to do that as well, whatever your need. Uh, don't put it off. Let's pray. Father. We're so grateful for your unfailing love that sees all of our hurts, all of our wrongdoing, all of our stupidity, and you just continue to love us. Lord, may we not cheapen that by continuing in our sin. May we realize the errors of of our ways may we repent and may we turn back to you our first love 
And just as you have an unfailing love for us, may we reciprocate that with an unfailing love for you, God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And higher than the mountains that I face, and stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. be seated for just a moment except you guys you come on up here Stacy I will have you come up here as well and turn around and and uh, face everyone um, this is uh, this is Rod and Stacy this is Spencer's mom she became a part of our church uh, several weeks ago and and this is uh, Rod uh, her husband and and he's come forward this morning and he has said I want to be a better person and uh, I think he's come to the conclusion that and in order to do that, being a part of a church family is going to help him do that. And uh, so would you all just um, can just commit to praying for Rod as he strives to do better, just be better at everything that he does, be more like Jesus in all that he does. Um, and I know he's already a baptized believer in Christ, but he's come today to place his membership here. So uh, I'm going to have you just repeat after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God. Amen. Welcome, brother. Glad you're here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you guys. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat. Oh, wow. Yes, amen. Sp uh, Spencer. Kendall, you're up. All right. Hey, just a couple of quick reminders of announcements. Congregational meeting Wednesday evening at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. Uh, if you want to be a part of the Valentine's dinner, the Valentine's banquet, make sure you stop by and sign up uh, out at Connection Central. Um, those of you who are involved in Deborah Circle, and I apologize for just springing this right now, but it just came to our attention. You are, you're having a meeting Thursday evening. That is our school open house to the public. There are going to be people all over the building. So the Deborah Circle, don't know who makes that decision. You might want to think about uh, next, next Thursday, the 16th, instead of the 9th. If you need more details, just see me out back and we can talk about that. There was some money found that was dropped just inside the door on the way in. So, I'm not going to tell you how much it was, but if you think you lost some money, now if you come and say you lost $1,000, I know it's not you, okay? But if you did uh, drop some money or something, uh, see me, and uh, we'll make sure we can get that back to you. If you'd like to stand, I'm going to give you some uh, prayer concerns, uh, some people to lift up in prayer both today and throughout the week, and uh, then we'll close this morning. Uh, continue to pray for Rusty Houston, Barb Jasper, Geneva Abner, Judy Biedenkoff. Uh, be in prayer for Jim Miller's brother, Dick Miller, uh, Beth Taylor's friend who's battling some cancer. Uh, continue to pray for our shut-ins. So many of them are wanting to be here so badly and they can't. Um, we hope they're able to watch online, but keep them in your prayers and check on them. Uh, Wendy Fedor, who just joined our church here the last couple of weeks, uh, was uh, rushed to the hospital as well, so keep her in your prayers. I don't know if you heard yet, but there were two police officers who were shot in Mitchell, Indiana, this morning, and uh, air airlifted to Indianapolis, so uh, keep, the keep those two officers and their families in your prayer as well. And always, always, let's keep praying for the lost, right, that they could find this love that we're talking about this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we are so thankful, Lord, uh, for this opportunity. Father, we come to you right now um, with joy for all the events and things that are happening and the things that we get to partake in as part of your church body. Lord, but we also bring these concerns and these prayer requests to you right now as well, and we lay them at the foot of the cross. Father, we lay them at your feet and just uh, pray that you would deal with them as only you know how to do. And we pray that your will be done in, in these situations. Uh, Lord, we thank you for, for Rod this morning and, and his uh, coming forward to want to be a part of this church family and, and uh, just become uh, better and receive that love that Ron has so um, uh, graciously shared with us today. We thank you for the words that you gave Ron to share with us. Help us all to take them to heart and um, just uh, thank you for that love. And Father, as we leave now and we leave this building and go out to be your church, may we always lead the gospel with everyone that we come into contact with. And we pray it all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world.